How y'all doing? Hey. Don't hate me like that. Hey. How y'all doing? Y'all good? How y'all doing? Y'all good? So, real spit, I am um, a real high energy performer. Uh, uh, I promise you I am. I know I look sleepy as shit right now, but that's okay. Um, I am a real high energy performer. I promise you I am, but I can't give you all my energy without you giving me some back. That means that in this set, if I say something that makes you want to laugh, clap, yell, holler, high five, by all means do so. Is that all right? Yes? I'm saying it's Monday. Let's have a good damn time. Is that okay? Yes. Shout out to the people online real quick. Let's shout them out and give them a round of applause. They, they, they're tuning in from all over the world on the interwebs. All right, so I'm going to do some poems. It's going to be fucking good, I, I hope. Uh, I'm the, telling you, I'm the shit. Um, you will love it. I don't know. No, uh, I hope it'll be good. We'll air hug. I don't have product, but that's all good. It's, it's all cool. We're here. We're together. We're spitting poems, and it's all good. And before uh, I even jump into this, give it up for your host one more time. Yes, yes, yes. And one more round of applause for all of the poets who came and ripped this stage. It's been beautiful. It's been beautiful. I am a full-time university professor. And my job is exactly as sexy as it sounds. On most days, I simply read an ungodly amount. And when I'm not doing that, I'm teaching. And when I'm not doing that, I'm either prepping for classes or grading students' work. And when I'm not doing that, I'm sitting in on committee meetings, doing service work for my department, my college, my discipline, the committee community in which I live all while trying to maintain a full-time performance poetry career and conduct my own research. In other words, I put in work, y'all. I love my job, though. On most days, teaching for me is like one of those really complicated math problems where if Johnny had, had 17 candy bars and then he boarded a train from Kansas going 90 miles an hour, uh, uh, how many basketballs can he burn on the roof before the children start crying again? In other words, it's confusing as fuck. But I love how we come together and almost always figure it out. I had this one student, y'all, brown as the border that crossed her. Asked if I think her white colleagues understand that her family had been trying to get her into college for generations. Said she wanted to understand the weight of that. Wanted them to know that she picked this campus the same way her grandfather picked fruit. That it was slow and painful, but what else was she gonna do? Said, said she was upset that her colleagues seem angrier with, with illegal immigration than they do with banking practices. Fact, it would cost this country's government roughly $70 billion to pay for all tuition at public college and universities. Instead, we spend that much to subsidize the cost and over 100 billion in student loans. When tuition is steadily rising and starting salaries are dropping, degrees become no different than a designer bag, a cheap fashion statement, not even worth the trip to the mall. No one ever tells you, no one ever tells you, no one ever tells you that you have to drown in debt in hopes of making it to the shore, that the loan system is a lot like Alcatraz, like Rikers Island. We're getting screwed while the guards don't even even have the decency to pretend to look the other way. The only difference between student debtors and prisoners is that students are taught to think they're on the outside of the bars. What world do we live in where we bail out banks who are too big to fail even though they bank on the failure of our students? What world do we live in where, where college professors struggle to pay back student loans? It's like we learn nothing from Biggie. We're getting high on our own supply. Some days, y'all. Some days I feel like a wolf in sheep clothing. Or better, I feel like a shepherd leading his flock to slaughter. I teach classes on structural racism and gender inequality in a system that is more willing to punish its students for plagiarism than it is for sexual assault. What are we telling? 
What are we telling our students when we teach them that the thoughts of dead white men are far more valuable than their own bodies? The university has become a Black Friday sale. It does not care whose body gets trampled in the stampede of it all, but us being here is a revolutionary act. We force them to peel back the curtains to a well-manicured show. We watch them squirm whenever we open our mouths because they know we're not comfortable with just getting into the system. We want to claw this motherfucker down. And that should, and that should, and that should shouldn't make them uncomfortable. It ain't called growing pains for nothing. So, if Johnny left Kansas on a train going 90 miles an hour with $170,000 in debt, how much longer will it take for us to realize that if he actually burned basketballs on a roof, it would still make so much more sense than all of this? Dun, dun, dun. We good? So, <laughs> we good? So, um, I, I am, I, I'm, I'm a for real ass professor. Uh, I'm mean as shit though. <laughs> I'll be mean as shit. I'll be looking at papers like, really? Is this how you want to introduce yourself to me as a scholar? Is this, you, is this your first? This is how intellectually you, uh, you are you, let's, let's do it again. <laughs> uh, they love me. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right, poem. Um, <laughs> oh, shit. I really do. I have a good time being a teacher. I really, it's fucking crazy. There's a lot of it. It's like, what the fuck are we doing today? Um, but, you know, it is what it is. All right, here we go. Poem. You said what? Oh, that's one of my favorite sentences. In there. Hey, when so-and-so do? Syllabus, page five. And they'd be like, oh, shit. Oh, well. All right, here we go. <laughs> oh, all right, poem. I'm going to do this poem. I, like, rarely ever do this poem, so I'm going to do this poem. It's a love poem. Oh. <laughs> All right, here we go, Bo. <laughs> Y'all got I'm gonna just keep laughing. Okay, I'm sorry. I really am a silly person for the most part of my life. I do a lot of serious shit, but I'm like super serious. I mean, silly, it's hard. It's hard to give me, I joke and stuff in class. I'm like, yo, that's hilarious. All right, here we go, Bo. <laughs> I'm trying to focus, this is what I'm trying to do. On the night, we first pretzeled our bodies into awkward love notes for one another. The noise outside my small one bedroom apartment was loud. The glaring car alarms, the worn tires scratching dirty street corners, the drunks and their out of tune pop hit sing-alongs and you loved me no matter of the busy of the world beyond our flesh, beyond the sweet messy of our lips, we were caught up in one another and I kissed you slowly. Remember, behind your right earlobe, my mouth made of all the beautiful things I have yet to tell you. I whisper softly, reserve this spot for me always. From this point forward, I live here. The following morning, you came to me. Your smile in one hand and God in the other, and I have never stopped confusing the two. I remember wanting to sing Stevie Wonder's entire catalog off key for you. <laughs> the sun angrily beat against my window pane and I still miss Los Angeles. That city of forgetting, the harvest in your laugh, how you smile from ear to ear like the dancing wire hangers that once hung the clothes of my former lover, you still feel me. That night I called you. I hid and I love you somewhere between hello and good night. I told you the story of the homeless man who tried to squirt me with a water gun. He followed me for nearly half a block. I was confused. I was really angry. I never thanked you for being my lighthouse.
That's a very true story. This homeless, this man, I'm very serious. He really tried to square me. This is a very true story. He tried to square me with a water gun. I was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? He like, okay, I'm walking down the street. He, <laughs> he jumped out the thing, like the, the bus stop. He was like, ha ha, youngster. And I was like, no, no. I'm, like, he said it like we agreed to this scenario. He's like, ha ha. I was like, mm -mm, no, we didn't, we didn't agree to any of this shit. Uh, don't, don't do that. And he pulled it out. He's like, ha 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 ha. And I was like, no, 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 at all. Like, I don't want this shit in my life. And so I went the other way. And he was like, wait a minute. I was like, no, I'm not going to wait for this shit. I'm not going <laughs> to. That's part of it. The, the other part, the water wasn't clear. So that also fucked me up. <laughs> It's all true. I'm not making any. Then the best shit. So I had an ex friend who called me. And I don't even talk to this guy anymore. He's because he's an asshole. But that's another story. He goes, "Hey man, saw you running down the street from somebody. You okay?" I said, "What the fuck? You didn't stop then for? You fucking can't be trusted. You piece of shit." And that's the story of how I lost the friend. All right, here we go. All of that shit is true. I'm very serious. I stopped talking to him after that. He can't be fucking trusted. He left me out there in them streets, literally. Literally. All right, here we go. I'm gonna do that. Y'all think I'm fucking around. I'm very serious. That shit, I was traumatized. I said, what are you fucking trying to square me with a water gun? I've never done this poem either in public, so. Poem. It's called Black Boys Slash Cold Slash Deserted. It is a 30 degree night in the middle of the desert. And this is the coldest weather us boys from South Central had ever experienced up until now. We were 16, maybe 17, or, or maybe 18, I don't know. We were men, maybe. Black boys are never allowed to be just black boys and I think about South Central a lot and that one time we stripped my cousin naked just to laugh the fact that he hadn't grown pubes yet and ain't that funny that he was not yet a man that he was still growing that he was too weak to stop all of us that we were already predators that we already knew how to do America's work that he was too stupid to grow yet 10 years later that same cousin tried to fight me over a card game a month before that an educated white man accused me of playing the race card because I'm a savage in my response to racism because I don't play games anymore because America is too cold because I know what happens to weak black boys and I am a man now maybe and isn't that what being a black man is all about how the world works to reduce you even if you only want your freedom a few years after that I met a woman who was into social justice she knew all the right words wanted to undo America's work wanted to save the world from the dark but I asked her how else will we know how much stars shine? Wanted to reduce my shine. Funny, isn't that what being a black man is all about? How they want to save you from yourself? How they love hip hop? How they want to go to all the parties? How they want to go to all the clubs? How they never really want to know the night? How cold it all is? How deserted? So I'm from LA, from Los Angeles, and um, this is fucking cold. And, <laughs> and listen, anything under, don't, no, it's not my ass. Any, <laughs> anything under fi uh, 55 is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> this is jacket weather. I almost wore a beanie. Shit is stupid. And this is not for, <laughs> so serious, very, very serious. Growing up, I remember one time it got to the low 40s and they, they kept us from school. They was like, yo, we can't. <laughs> Can't fucking have y'all at school in this weather. It's ridiculous. Stay home, turn on the heat. Eat some soup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, shit. And then I moved to Chicago to get my doctorate, and that was a whole other shit. I, I almost quit. I moved to Chicago, and when a winter hit, I was like, oh, shit. I'm convinced that they built this city in the, in the fucking springtime, and then winter hit and was like, fuck it, we're here now. Um, <laughs> Fuck, uh, we already built that shit, so. Cause you do not build that shit, you don't build any of this shit up here in the winter time, not at all. This is, I don't even know how y'all operate uh, come January and February, I wouldn't do shit. I, <laughs> I've worked from home, I'd grub hub everything. <laughs> Fuck out of here, all right, poem. <laughs> oh 
the code is ridiculous. What the fuck is this? I, look, I have melanin because God wanted me to be in the sun. And that's, <laughs> this shit is for the sun, you know what I'm saying? Like all it is, my melanin is popping. <laughs> all right, poem. I'm dead serious. All right, here we go. I'm gonna do this. Um, it's a poem for my baby brother. My baby brother's super fucking hilarious. Um, just to put in perspective, uh, he is a two-year-old, uh, spoiled as all our hell. And I'm not gonna lie, I participate in the spoiling. I wanna be clear about that. Like, I'm not innocent of this shit. Um, and uh, one time I told her no, and she started crying. And it was no for her benefit. Like, she wanted to do some shit, like pour water on something. And I was like, no. She's like, eh. And my brother picked her up. He's like, don't be telling my baby bad words. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's very true story. He's fucking hilarious. Baby brother is three years younger than me. He is... A free ticket to an amusement park. He is the front row at a comedy show, a museum of laughter. Baby brother is always a good time. Being raised by a single mother meant that my job was to take care of him, which was always easier said than done. In the third grade, he lost a set of keys to our house no less than 12 times. When my mother saved up to buy us these expensive jackets for Christmas, he left his on the playground the first day he wore it to school. The teachers called my mother because he talked in class, because he fought in class, because one time in the first grade, he kissed a girl open mouth in the back of the class. <laughs> Baby brother is hip hop at a summer barbecue. He is loud, always gets the party going, and no matter how out of pocket he is, you cannot imagine a single thing in this world without him. When we, ah, oh, fuck that poem up. He is loud, holy shit. He is loud, always gets the party going, and no matter how out of, po out of pocket he is, you cannot imagine a single thing in this world without him. When he began learning about addition, he excitedly told me about it on our daily walk home from school. He asked, Javon, what's one plus? I, confused, asked, one plus what? We went back and forth like this until he finally gave up and said, you know, for you to be so damn smart, you don't know nothing. <laughs> That moment always stuck with me. It is the earliest memory I have of failing as a teacher. <laughs> Baby brother, these days, is teaching me a lot. He's teaching me so much. I think about one plus, and I think that maybe baby brother stumbled onto something accidentally. I think one plus is baby brother and his wife. One plus is baby brother, his wife, their newborn daughter. One plus is family. It is endless possibility. One plus is love because love does not always make sense, but it always adds up. And these days, baby brother is adding up. Yeah. Baby brother recently got married. And I was not his best man. And honestly, I wasn't mad at him, but it did hurt a bit. Baby brother and I were never really that close growing up together. I used to beat him up often. At some point, I began hitting him so much that he started to hide till my mom came home. But this was never my first act of violence. We teach boys that in order to become men, they have to kill off their emotional selves. And I became a damn good drone. I blew up everything in my path. My fists were hammers. I treated everything like nails. My masculinity is a well-hung portrait in the hallway of a crumbling house. And every time the wind blows, it's the only thing I think to grab nowadays. I'm afraid it's all I'll have to hand down to my children. My masculinity is a facade. It is a, a, a a poorly built suburban neighborhood trying to fool us into thinking the entire system isn't coming crashing to the ground. It is an armadillo, a small mammal with a hard shell who knows how easily it can become roadkill. When I was younger, I broke my collarbone playing street football with baby brother. They left me out in the middle of the street like a lost Jesus or something. They didn't believe the boy was in as much pain as he could not say he was in. And isn't that just the perfect metaphor? Oh. 
So, so I'm on the Twitters. I think this will be the last one, yes? Is that? Yeah. I'm on the Twitters um, and the Instagrams. Look me up. Uh, I mostly put ridiculous things online. Um, they go from really ridiculous to really political, like randomly, because that's how my mind works. Like, I might do a whole series on the advantages of being short. Um, yeah, like, first off, I don't pay for extra leg room on an airplane, so fuck it. Um, don't need it, you know what I'm saying? People are like, can, you lean, can I lean back? Lean all the way back, player. Get your fat jaw on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> lean back, lean back. I don't, I, you know what I mean? Um, I don't care. I don't, I don't really pay attention to the cabinets and the kitchens. Like, I just walk, you know what I'm saying, with reckless abandon. <laughs> I'm not going to hit my head on them shits. Um, yeah, all kind of benefits to being short. Uh, so it's great. Um, and then I might drop some political jewels out of nowhere. Um, I have thoughts on this election. <laughs> I, no, I don't, I'm not gonna even get into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, poem. But yeah, Javonism. Everything I, I have is Javonism. That's J-A-V-O-N-I-S-M. Uh, and follow, or, or not. I, you know, you don't have to. I can't make you. You do whatever the hell you wanna do with your social media. Um, poem. <laughs> All right. I amuse the shit out of myself. That's like, I'm going to have a good time. You can join in if you want or not. Like, <laughs> hey, listen, I, <laughs> I told this racist guy, he was being racist. I was like, yo, man, I really don't give a shit if you like me or not. It's your fucking loss. I'm a great human being. And <laughs> he thought I was going to get upset. He's like, well, fuck you. And I was like, okay. That's personal racism, it's not structural. It's structural still is fucking up my livability, and that's a whole other fucking story. <laughs> I can't just be like, fuck you to structural, you know what I'm saying? Poem. <laughs> All right, here we go, poem. On the night, they decided not to indict Darren Wilson for the cold-blooded murder of Mike Brown. My body, a well-framed riot, chose not to protest. Instead, like any good choir director, I shut down everything and I demanded a better harmony. The protests were in a part of Oakland I walked to near every day. But on that night, I closed my windows because I could not deal with yet another choir lifting the rafters about more black death. I did not want to feel sad or angry. I didn't want white supremacy to tell me how to feel. Yet once again, that night, I cut off all my lights because black was the only God I knew worth praying to. Asked, asked, I asked if Jesus beat a black woman. Said the only black people I know who could turn that small amount of food into feast are big mamas. We laughed, we joked, we talked about bones and spades, about how all the old black men I know who smoke menthols know how to fix carburetors. We marveled at how creative black kids his arm said they must be this world ain't never been saved so they build new ones out of scrap paper bones and possibilities that night i danced on beat which is to say i chose to be happy and black yeah. and how political that choice was how political that choice always is the first time i ever saw a man shot to death his arms flailing wildly like he was dancing for a God. He knew he was about to see what an unholy prayer his body was. Arms were all in the wrong direction, but this poem cannot be about black death. It is about how on that night we listened to Tupac. We tried to imagine heaven's ghetto, corner stores draped in gold, little girls playing double dutch, and him still dancing. The following morning, I called my mother because black is still the only God I know worth praying to. I wanted her to know her baby boy was still black and still alive. And how political our phone calls are, 
how political my phone calls with my mother always will be, but this poem cannot be about politics, cannot be about so-called black on black crime, cannot be about police brutality or state-sanctioned black death. This poem has to be about black joy. It has to be about fish fries and cookouts. It has to be about a place where all the little black kids know all the dances even before they come out. It is about how in some days, the most revolutionary thing I can do is enjoy my niece's laughter, how their brown faces bubble like good fried bologna sandwiches and ain't that like the blackest shit ever y'all this poem this poem this poem is about how when my brother came home from a tour in Iraq the first thing we did was make fun of each other we laughed then we said I love you it is about how when Tamir Rice was gunned down how black people band together to lift his mother out of the homeless shelter she had been living in it is about how when my aunt laid there in her deathbed waiting for the cancer to try and make a liar out of her own body she said sat there and cracked jokes. You cannot kill blackness. Too much of it is wrapped in an unshakable joy. And ain't that why they think we magic in the first place? That despite every reason not to, we still smile. We still laugh. We still love. We still black, y'all. We still. Thank you, thank you.